This morning, I'm, we're going to take a look at a little bit of a continuation from last week. We're going to continue to talk about joy. See, last week, we took uh, the, the, the time to look a little bit at a passage in Hebrews 12, where it just lays out that Jesus took the joy in the work that was set before him as he was going to endure the cross. If you, if you haven't read that passage, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's Hebrews chapter 12. It's, it's this idea that Jesus took joy in the work that he was about to do. And I ask the question, I ask the question, do we take joy in the work that is placed before us? We get to serve. We don't have to do it. Are you doing it with joy? We are called to serve. We are called to serve. But friends, serving is something we get to do. It's not something we have to do. So this week I want to talk a little bit more about joy and a little bit in a different context. Um, so, but before we get there, let's lay out from the, the surface, let's clearly define what it means, what joy means. Um, as, Christians, as a Christian, I'm fully aware that joy is supposed to be one of the nine components of the fruit of the Spirit. It's, in other words, all believers are supposed to exhibit joy in an ever-increasing measure. I've also heard continuous times that joy is not contingent on our present circumstances, but a certain knowledge that everything will work out for the good in the end. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in this morning. Um, as it has been promised in numerous places in Scripture. So let's get a little bit closer look at this word joy. It appears 245 times in the NIV translation of the New Testament. That's a lot. It appears 245 times in the NIV translation. It also appears additional 154 times in the word joyful, which is essentially the verb of joy, um, putting in action. Um, or sorry, rejoice, not joyful. Rejoice. Um, it appears 154 times for a total of 399 times. In other words, the Bible has a lot to say about it. The Bible has a lot to say about this word joy. But what does it mean? So the question I have, oh my goodness, I just messed up my notes pretty good here. We'll see if I can... I moved a table around and whatever. Uh, we'll get to it. So let's take a little bit of a look at this word joy. And when you don't know what a word means, where do you go? Wrong. You go to Siri. You ask Siri. So let's ask Siri this morning. You, uh, yeah, I tricked you. All right, let's see. Siri, what does joy mean? Checking my sources. Blah, 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 blah. Um... That's not what you told me yesterday, Siri. You told me something better yesterday. I'm going to get to Siri's definition in a second, but we are actually going to go to a dictionary, a few different dictionaries, and just to see what, how we define joy in today's world. Defined by the Apple Dictionary, this is a really weak definition of the word. It says, a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. Okay. We'll sit there. This isn't, quite, this isn't quite what I was expecting as I was looking for a definition of this word. And, and perhaps it maybe says a little bit about our, our world view of joy today uh, and, how, and how we sort of associate. I was expecting something more like this, which is uh, the Webster's 1913 edition, because I didn't want today's edition. The 1913 edition defines joy as the passion or emotion excited by the acquisition or expectation of good, pleasurable feelings or emotions caused by success success, good fortune, and the like, or by a rational prospect of possessing what we love or desire. That sounds a little bit closer to what I, I was thinking that it might mean, but I love this Wikipedia definition that Siri gave me yesterday. I tried this last night, and I'm glad I did, because she did not give me this one when I pulled it up this morning. It says, joy is an emotion in response to a pleasant observation or remembrance thereof. The reason for a joyful reaction is usually that some expectation or need has been satisfied. Joy is usually expressed as a smile, a laughter, or, or exclamation, exclamation of joy. Joy differs from happiness in that it is an emotion. Happiness, on the other hand, is what we might think of as a feeling, which is more fleeting. That's a little bit more as to what I was thinking. What I want you to get this morning, before we look at our passage that we're going to get to, is that joy is not the same as happiness. Joy is not the same as happiness. Two very different things. I got a chart on the screen here for you. 
This is going to help us a little bit as to how they're so different. The meaning. Happiness is an emotion in which one expresses feelings ranging from the contentment and satisfaction to bliss and intense pleasure. It differs from joy in that joy is a stronger, less common feeling than happiness. Witnessing or achieving selflessness to the point of personal sacrifice frequently triggers this emotion. Feeling spiritually connected to a God or to people. Interesting. This is borrowed from some random guy on the web. I can't even remember his name. Causes earthly experiences, material objects. Those are sort of the things that that make us happy. And joy seems to be from the spiritual experience. Caring for others, gratitude, thankfulness. Emotion is often expressed as an outward expression of elation, whereas joy is, is more of an inward peace and contentment. Time frame, temporary. Happiness is temporary based on, on an outward circumstance. We get happy. I get really happy when I hit a birdie in golf. You have no idea how happy I get and how not happy I get when I hit a double bogey or when I hit a three putt. It's just like, get out of here. It's happiness is an emotion. Joy is this inward peace. It's temporary, but joy is lasting based on inward circumstances. An example, in the midst of life's ups and downs, happiness can still be present. An example of joy is serving others, possibly through sacrifice, with no possible personal gain, witnessing justice for the less fortunate, feeling close to God. That's good. I guess we can finish it off. Life. I don't even know what he meant by life, actually. Like, what is that subcategory? Happiness can be experienced from any good activity, food, or company. Joy is a byproduct of moral lifestyle. I find in the English language today, we can sometimes use happy and joy a little bit simultaneously. That's good, Ken. But in the Greek Testament, in which the New Testament was originally written, these two words represent two very different thoughts. Happiness was a word typically used to express feelings, as we've already suggested, which are a result of external circumstances. The word joy, however, could be used to express the idea of inner contentment in spite, in spite of external circumstances. As we can see, True joy is clearly something far deeper and far wider than happiness. Happiness comes and goes. And perhaps joy can as well in seasons, but it's different. As one author describes it, joy and happiness are wonderful feelings to experience, but very different. Joy is more consistent and cultivated internally. It comes, it comes when you make peace with who you are, why you are, and how you are. Whereas happiness tends to be an externally triggered and is based on other people, things, places, thoughts, and events. So as I was preparing this week, I was actually just flipping. I was started in Hebrews 12, and I just kept reading. That's, sometimes that's just what you've got to do. And right after the book of Hebrews is this wonderful little book, James. How many of you know it? How many of you love James? Lots of people love it. If you're Martin Luther, you don't, but don't worry about that. Some people love it, and I actually, I love the book of James. It is so practical. It is so contemporary. It is so just ready there to chew on and eat. So would you turn with me to James chapter 1? Okay. Starting in verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among, among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Skipping down to verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under 
trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Right off the bat in this passage, this word joy is slammed into our face. Right off the bat, James is starting this letter. First of all, James is writing this letter to... Um, to this community that, that is likely Jewish. It's likely Jewish based on, on some of the verses that he talks about in, in, in chapter 2. Uh, it's likely that this was a community that was poor. It, this also comes from like chapter 2. There's a mention in chapter 5 and chapter 4. Um, it's also likely that this was a community that's new to the faith. That I mean, obviously, I think most people were new to the faith at that point. But this seemed to be newer than some of the other churches that were being written to um, in the New Testament. And, and they were clearly being oppressed. Because there were, James talks over and over again about the imp- oppression that this community um, was was facing. The thing I love about the book of James is it doesn't take a whole lot of directing around to figure out what he's trying to get at. He's writing to this group of believers that are pretty new to the faith, but he just gets straight to the point. Unlike any of the most or most of the other letters in the New Testament, uh, there's usually a long greeting, say hello to this person from this person, or even at the end, Paul, Paul usually will write with all these regards and all this other stuff, but James is like, hey there, servant of Jesus, here let's get to the point and then at the end he's like okay peace out like he just he gets into it he gets out of it it's a pretty easy book to understand and it's got so much beauty and so much wisdom in it so back to the passage James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ and to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations greetings consider it pure joy Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That's a little bit of a that's a little bit of a backwards way of thinking to the way our society approaches things. Why would why on earth would I consider it pure joy? Or if you're using happiness interchangeably, why would I be happy when I have to go through bad stuff? Why would I be happy when I have cancer? Why would I be happy when my grandma dies? Why would I be, take joy in, in all, these, all this stuff that happens, these trials of many kinds? Why? That seems so countercultural. But he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because, because, You know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let the perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Friends, this morning it seems that James, who for those of you that don't know, most think is the brother of Jesus. There's a few different Jameses in the New Testament. You can study that on the side if you want. Most think this, is the, this was the brother of Jesus. James, in this instance, is saying, take joy in the bad stuff that happens in your life because it's making you complete. It's making you who you are. And sometimes that doesn't make a lot of sense. And sometimes we don't like that. And sometimes I wish that I didn't have to go through some of the stuff. And I really wish that some of the people, even in this room, didn't have to go through some of the stuff that they're going through. I really do wish that. Because it sucks. And we live in a fallen world. And we live in a world where bad things happen. But friends, this morning, would you consider it pure joy? In the midst of joy, in the midst of trials, take joy. Because we know that God is sovereign. In the midst of trials, take joy. Because we know that God is sovereign. Sometimes it doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense why there are millions of children dying of starvation. It doesn't make a lot of sense why... Anything. It doesn't make a lot of sense why when we just walk down the streets of Skid Row, there's tens of thousands of people living in tents, starving and smoking crack pipes. It doesn't make a lot of sense. 
Not, not everything makes a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense when you go through these, these horrific diseases and all this other stuff. Trials and stuff and persecution happens, friends. But how do we take joy in it? How do we take joy in it? We'll get to that in a second. But first, just back to the passage. That verse 3 is key. It's, it's key to this whole thing that these trials are, are there for a purpose. And although we can wrestle with how much God plans it, how much God does this and everything else, you can wrestle with that. And, and we, don't, we don't really know. Um, but it obviously is allowed to happen. But no... That the testing of your faith produces perseverance. One translation says persecution produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be made mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generally Generously, not generally, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So, in the midst of trials, take joy, for we know we can trust in God's sovereignty. Trials produce perseverance, and perseverance produces maturity, and God gives wisdom and good things to those who believe. I love this passage in John chapter 16, and we're going to take a, take a look at it here. So would you turn your Bibles over with me? And this is the disciples that, they're just confused, I think. They're, they're confused as to why Jesus is, is leaving. They're confused. They've got so many questions. And starting in verse 16, Jesus says, went on to say this. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while, you will see me no more. And after a little while, you will see me. And because I am going to the Father, they were confused. They were this. They kept asking, Why does he mean, or what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted him to ask about this, so he, asked, he said to them, Are you asking one another what I mean when I said in a little while? There's a lot of repeating of this one phrase in this little passage. <laughs> Are you asking one another what I meant when I said in a little while you will see me no more? And then after a little while you will see me. Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to childbirth has, be, has pain because her time has come. But when the baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and, and you will rejoice, but no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you've, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Though I've, been asked, though I've been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name, sorry, in that day you will ask in my name. I am not saying anything that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I I came from God, and I love this. Oh no, we're getting to it. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus, 
Sorry, then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see what you know, that you know all things and that you do not even need to have asked anyone ask you the questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Now you believe, Jesus replied. A time is coming, and in fact it has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. Take heart, because I have overcome the world. You want to know where joy comes from? You want to know where that innermost sense of peace and calmness and and joy that overflows your heart that's not happiness. You want to know where it comes from? It comes from knowing that Jesus has overcome the world. It comes from knowing that this story is being written and it, we know how it ends. We, we, we're in the middle of a story that's unfolding before our eyes and sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes we go through stuff that sucks and doesn't make sense and maybe we shouldn't go through, or at least in our own eyes, we shouldn't go through. But joy comes in those moments when we can say, God, I know you're in control. I know that you have overcome the world. Take heart, for I have overcome, is what Jesus is saying. These disciples were confused. They were, obviously, they asked the question like five times. But he says, a time is coming, and it is fact come when you be scattered and each to your own. You will leave me. All alone, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I'm just going to invite the band up, and they're going to come and, and play a song and as, we, as we wrap up here. But I want to close by saying this. Living by faith and in his peace, because he is in control, or living on an emotional roller coaster because I have taken mis- I've mistakenly presumed that either I am in control or no one is in control is a choice. Let me repeat that. Living by faith and in his peace, because he is in control, or living on an emotional roller coaster because I have mistakenly presumed that either I am in control or no one is in control is a choice. Sooner or later, every Christian will be tempted, every Christian will be given the opportunity to trust God in the face of circumstances that simply seem too complicated to understand from a rational perspective. It will happen. Like it or not, we are not the masters of our own fate. We're neither the master, nor are we God. And fate, blind chance, it doesn't guide anything. We are his workmanship, created in him for good works, which he has planned. We sometimes forget that God is neither a distant relative who does not care, a colleague who needs our opinion, or a cosmic Santa Claus that can be manipulated. Trials provide Christians the privilege of standing on biblical truth and remembering who is the creator and who is the creation. Trials provide Christians the privilege of standing on biblical truth and remembering who is the creator and who is the creation. So I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what is going on in your life and maybe there's nothing. Maybe you're in a season where things are going really well and I'm so happy. But maybe you're in a season where things are tough. Maybe you're in a season where you're asking these questions, God, why? And let me tell you something this morning. It might not make 
the steps that you have to take after this service any easier. But let me tell you something this morning. Jesus has overcome those things already. He has. The best part about Christians, the best part about this faith that I, that, that I have is that I know the ending of the story. I know how it ends. Jesus is going to return and he's going to redeem things to the way they were supposed to be. And we're going to enter into eternal presence of God with no more pain, no more suffering, no more trials, the way things were designed. The song that we're going to sing is so powerful. And it says it as well. You know it. We've sang it before. And the bridge sings that even the waves and wind know his name. No matter what you're going through this morning, no matter what you go through in any season of life, you can take peace and rest and joy in knowing that God is in control and he, even the waves and wind know his name. Friends, living by faith and in his peace because he is in control or living on an emotional roller coaster because I've mistakenly presumed that either I'm in control or no one is in control is a choice. It's a choice. Are you going to choose to trust God and to take joy in your trials because you know that they per- as you persevere this per, per, wow, that's a lot of peace. As you know that you face these trials and as you persevere, it's actually making you complete. It's making you into who God has you, who wants you to be. So my prayer this morning is that whatever you're going through, whatever you have gone through, whatever you're going to go through, that in the midst of those times, in the midst of those trials, you would be able to take joy and you'd be able to say it as well even when it's not easy to say because we know how the story ends God thank you for today thank you for your word thank you Jesus that you have indeed instructed us to take heart to be still, to be calm, and to know that you have overcome the world. Thank you, God, for the trials that we each face. Because they are making us into who you would have us be. That they're making us complete. So God, may we face them with joy and with perseverance. But God, through them, would you be our comfort? Would you be our peace? Would you be the rock that we can stand firm on? God, I pray for every person in this room this morning. If they're going through something that's overwhelming, God, I pray that your spirit would be with them in a way that is surpassing our understanding, God, that you will bring a peace and a calmness and a comfort that that is just beyond words. And God, for those of us that are in a season where where we're, we're really not struggling with a whole lot and we're just pushing forward, God, may we be the church that surrounds the people that are going through this stuff and love them and walk with them and be compassionate with them. And may we take joy in doing so. So thank you for your word today, God. Would you keep speaking to us as we go in Jesus' name.